a proud member of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. We are back with you for another episode of the Film Appraisers. This is the podcast that evaluates your favorite films. Each episode, we discuss a film brought to us by a listener or a guest, and then we appraise it in each of the following categories. Narrative, music, technique, uniqueness, and longevity. Each category can receive a maximum of $20,000 for a possible $100,000 for the most valuable film. And then we see where it stands next to the classics and other films brought to us by guests or listeners. My name is Josh, and on this episode, the boss has returned, and she brings a really fun film. It's the 2008 superhero classic from Christopher Nolan, The Dark Knight, and that's starring Christian Bale, Heath Ledger, Gary Oldman, Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, Aaron Eckert, Maggie Gyllenhaal. It's quite a cast. This is episode 37, Order, Chaos, and Consequences. Joining us, as always, the white knight of ear glue media, Joe Caine. Josh, I messed up. I did not watch The Dark Knight. I watched A Knight's Tale instead. Uh, <laughs> does that also have Heath Ledger? It does have Heath Ledger, so it's going to be okay. <laughs> Ledger was great in that, too, so we can just yeah. run to this. My notes should apply well enough. I He was the best part of both movies, so I think we'll be okay. Uh, yep. Well, instead of playing The Dark Knight, I've got 10 things I hate about you playing, so we'll be all right. It's no big deal. Also the best part of that movie. Turns out very much so. he had a good career, a little short. <laughs> All right, so to introduce our wonderful guest, she's brought us great films to appraise like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and The Fifth Element. Filling in the guest chair today, but she is no guest. Please welcome Morgan. Morgan, welcome back to the show. Hello, boys. How are y'all doing today? Much better now. Doing much better now that we've got a, a good film to watch. And I, and I promise I'm not just kissing up to the boss. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to get into this movie today. Um, but first, I have something I need to tell you. Um, okay. Well, I had to uh, kick Todd to the curb. He no longer works. You let Todd here. go. Yeah. I'm not he ever worked here in the first place. Good riddance. Not surprised. He was just yeah. Such a slacker, and uh, he was. And he finally just stole one too many post-it notes. <laughs> the, it was, it wasn't went. the fact that he never showed up to work. It was the fact that he took it's one too many post-it right. notes. <laughs> well, they're they're close to my heart. I love them. <laughs> Noted. I'm gonna return. I'm gonna return all those post-it notes that I took. Yeah, he's he's had plenty of chances to show up and and not steal post-it notes. And since the buck stops with Morgan, looks like that's that. Joe, this is episode 37, but you know, with all the like, but the bonus coverage and all those Patreon specials, I think we're like well over 50 episodes. And a lot of that coverage you can find at patreon.com slash film appraisers, including the after show, which for our patrons immediately follows this main discussion. Last week, we had a special guest join us in that after show, but even better, Joe gave us a very well attempted Southern accent. No, I didn't. But you also, you also, <laughs> no, it was great. Oh, it was really yeah. good. It was, it was horrendous, but uh, I'm glad I did it. But it doesn't beat your impromptu Forrest Gump impression. I thought that was really fun <laughs> when you said, I'm not a smart man. <laughs> I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> we would love for all of you to check that out, but we are not here to shamelessly plug one of our, one of our Patreon perks. We are here to discuss the dark night. No, we're, so, we're here to beg for money. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, send money now, mom. No, we're here to talk about the dark night. And let's start with the log line. That's where we typically start. Remember, a log line is our one to two sentence summary, kind of pulls the audience in. It's like that hook uh, that make you want to watch watch the film. So our log line, courtesy of IMDb. Wow, this one's really specific. When the menace known as the Joker wreaks havoc, and chaos on the people of Gotham, Batman must accept one of his greatest psychological and physical tests of his ability to fight injustice. <laughs> That's very specific. No other film is going to be able to claim that one. <laughs> but before we get into our discussion, I, I would really like to know from you, Morgan, what is, a, what is it about The Dark Knight that makes it one of your favorite films? I think probably my favorite aspect of this movie is that it takes these 
over the top um cartoonish characters and it kind of brings them back down to our level it it brings them back to reality and makes it feel very real and not just a like you know oh wow like you know th- it's not just cgi it makes it feel very like threatening and scary yeah. and suspenseful yeah without the without the Bruce Wayne character who can do whatever he wants, which I I assume if you probably had that much money, you could, but everything else could actually happen, right? Mm -hmm. That's like something that could happen in the world. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's very, very grounded. Let's talk before we get into the, the five categories that we use to appraise the film. Let's talk a little bit about just in general, I'd like to know where Batman stands with you guys as in terms of superhero or comic books or, or, or whatnot. I can tell you, He's definitely one of my favorites, along with Spider-Man. I think Batman and, and Spider-Man are really at the top. But how does he how does he land with you guys? Um, for me, Batman, I can't say he's one of my favorites. He's definitely he's definitely very awesome and um, cool, and just the whole backstory is amazing. But mm-hmm. I typically lean a little more towards the more playful. Um, charismatic superheroes like Iron Man and and Spider Man. Spider Man's pretty charismatic. Yeah, I, so similar. The, Batman's definitely my favorite DC hero, but there's yes. for sure a handful yeah. of Marvel heroes that land ahead of him for me. And I think that's largely because tonally, I just prefer Marvel's tone over DC. DC got in this like real dark, dour, depressing tone. Um, mm-hmm. kind of, I want to say like they really hit their stride with that, like in the eighties and they've just kept continuing to double down on it. And I just don't, it doesn't land with me. Uh, and whereas like, obviously everybody who knows me knows number one, Captain America always been, always will be, uh, he's not playful, but he is like, I find that like innocence, in a really like like comical level of innocence to be fun and funny. Where yeah. like Iron Man is sort of the same as Batman, but he has a sense of humor, which Batman is completely devoid of always. Uh like there's just like he's just <laughs> like right. there's a, there's a reason when you search yeah. the the gif button on your keyboard for Batman, it's like a hundred gifs of Batman crying first or Batman standing in the rain or <laughs> Batman with his head hung. The one low. in the rain, yeah. yeah. Like it's all depressing Batman. There's no there's no like and then you get far enough down and then there's that one of Adam West dancing in the sixties doing like yes. the eye thing. Yep. And that's like the only playful Batman in the entire catalog, right? Uh but I do really like the character. He just definitely falls I mean, overall, like if I had to, if I rank choice to my whole list, he's probably like f- five or six on the list, which is 20 higher than the next DC hero for me. That was going to be my next question. How much further down do you have to go to find a DC character? Who would that be? You think? I don't even know. I mean, honestly, it's definitely not Superman. I I do not like Superman at all. I find that like that, that <laughs> like the, the Superman problem, right? The overpowered nature that takes all of the suspense out of all of his stories where the, every story turns yeah. out to be like a, what well, we have to use kryptonite to make this story a thing. Um, really kill. Like, I just do not like Superman. I don't find it entertaining at all. I mean, maybe wonder woman comes in. Um, at least there's like an interesting backstory with her. So maybe she hits mm-hmm. the next one, but honestly, I do think, though, I will say, and this will play in here for sure, I think DC does a much better job with villains than Marvel. And I think Joker is probably, Mm -hmm. just in general, the best comic villain across the board. Yeah. Yeah. And not just in this film, I think just in general, Joker, the character of Joker, the menace of, of a character who just exists to cause chaos. He has no grand, he never ever has a grand plan to, like, take over or or gain power or gain wealth. He just like, like, you know, like Alfred says in this, he just does things. He just <laughs> wants to see the world burn, right? Like he Alfred says, he just, he just wants to mess things up. And it's, it's like the most terrifying it's kind of, it's the most terrifying yeah. kind of villain, right? Yeah. No, I, I agree. Let's stay on that subject. So if we, if we think Joker is probably one of the best villains out there in the comic book realm, when we get these portrayal of Joker's, 
Do you guys have one that, I mean, I think I know this answer, but is there, I, I'm kind of expecting to be surprised here if, if you don't go a certain direction. <laughs> are there, are there, let's stick with the film because I know, I know Joe that you really like the video game version of Batman. Uh, what is his name? I forget it now. Oh, um, oh, I just, you know, I had it on the tip of my tongue until you asked, until you said you forgot and then it escaped me too. Yeah. Um, uh, o- uh, O'Connor or something like that, right? Um, uh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin yeah. O'Connor. Kevin O'Connor? Yeah. yeah, that sounds right. I think that's right. <laughs> Might be. So, it, so without going down that route of like the comic book version or video game version of Joker, sticking in the film world, do you have a favorite Joker? Or is there somebody in the entire filmography of Batman universe where a version of Joker is just one of your favorites you really enjoy? I, I have two answers. If we're going with a uh, quote unquote, and I apologize for the weird pun here, the quote unquote serious Joker, I think Heath, Heath Ledger <laughs> takes it for me. Um, <laughs> that is a good. That is a good pun. There's been some really good tie-ins here. I've heard like three or four quotes to the movie already from just general yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean that's going to come up later when we talk about rankings. Um, uh, yeah, I think for like a serious menacing Joker, I think Heath Ledger takes it for me. Joaquin Phoenix did a great job, and that. That is a different take for sure, but um, yeah. that's a more centered in reality kind of take uh, and a little more disturbing in, in their realism. But I found, but he, I always forget just how amazing he was as this Joker until I watched the film. Like I, I, yeah. I know it, it sticks in my head. I know that he was amazing as Joker in this. I go back to it and I'm still surprised every time scenes like, like when he's interrogating the fake Batman that are just yeah. borderline oh, terrifying. Yeah. They're just yeah. so creepy. Yeah. Um, but my second answer is when you look at like the real cartoonish over the top kind of Joker, it's definitely Nicholson, right? Nicholson takes that, that lane to a whole different level. And uh, mm-hmm. he, so those are my answers. It's either Nicholson for campy or, Ledger for serious and Joaquin Phoenix definitely did a great job. But I think, I think he fell short of Ledger, just not by a lot, but short. I definitely think I agree mostly with Joe. Um, Heath Ledger brought to the Dark Knight what makes it my favorite movie. Like he is a very raw, disturbed version of the Joker. He's not a gangster. Because uh, one thing about like Jack Nicholson and the comic book slash cartoon Joker and even Jared Leto's Joker is that they are gangsters mm-hmm. and and they just exude that. But Heath Ledger is just this like being this, you know, this monster hiding in the shadows, you know, just watching everybody panic. Um, and well, first let me say, I do not like Jared Leto's version of the Joker. <laughs> nah, nah, I'm not, I'm not, down <laughs> not with at that. all. It's, it's the, almost not even worth mentioning. Yeah. I, I really, it's the worst, it's right? For sure. The worst by like a wide margin. I think he just was trying too hard well, to I be think, honest. I think they were all trying too hard. I think some of that, that land, made that movie. I think some of that lands on hit on him for like the choices performance wise. But I mean, even just the choices like writing and direction wise, like if you look at the way that character is designed, like let's, let's do a quick photo only judgment of the Joker. Leto's Joker is like, like he's got the gold grill and the weird stylized Mm -hmm. hair. And he looks ridiculous. He's tattooed all over the place. His makeup is perfect. Like all that stuff. He looks ridiculous. That's his starting point. Ledger. Yep. I agree. Ledger, his makeup is all messed up. There are parts of his face where he missed it because he's a crazy person and didn't take time to put (laughs) his makeup on carefully. It makes more sense. Like, just visually, he looks like a crazy, just menacing villain. Where, like, so the starting point, we start at a totally different level already. Like, I don't even, I think if you had dressed up Ledger the way you dressed up Leto, we we would have a different talk about this movie. Right? And mm-hmm. that's just the starting yeah, point. And I then agree. I don't think Leto did a great job playing the character. Of course, the writing was way worse, too. But I, I just there's so much wrong with the current incarnation of DC stuff mm-hmm. that I don't 
don't really yeah. even know where to start. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, that's why I'm hoping with the Batman, they, they get a little bit back on track, at least in that other, that's that second universe that they're trying to do and get back to what, you know, what one of some of my favorite parts of Batman is he's the world's greatest detective. Like I, I hope we get to see some of that. I think that's a really cool aspect of him, but I, I agree with you guys. Heath Ledger, I, for me, it's like not even close. You're, you're right, Joe, if you're going to get that cartoonish playful, Tim Burton esque type world of Batman. Yeah, Jack Nicholson's great, but for me, it's not even close with Heath, Heath Ledger. I think Joaquin Phoenix did pretty good. I mean, don't get me wrong, he did he did good, but that's not what I want from a Joker. Like he he didn't scare me. You know, he just he seemed like a, it was a, a baby good, that got to the point sad. where it got. Yeah, it, was, it made you sad. It made you yeah, sad. He didn't, but he never scared me. I feel like so. What I feel like with the Joaquin Phoenix Joker is it made me sad. But I feel like if there was a Joaquin Phoenix Joker 2 that took over where that character was, we might see scary, right? Right. I felt like we saw yeah. we saw an origin story to the Joker we've never seen before, which also kind of bothered me a little bit because part of the Joker's you don't know existence where yeah. in the comics right. and, and in general is that you don't have an origin story. And then they kind of played it off. They kind of mentioned at... I don't remember if this was in the film or if this was in an interview I saw that like he might not be the Joker... Right. He yeah. might be the inspiration yeah. I, yeah. for the Joker. Like that's not necessarily an origin story for the Joker. I mean, even in that film, they did have to tip their tip their hat to the Michael Keaton um, Batman by showing the the alley. Right. Mm -hmm. So yep. so maybe this is not so maybe he is not actually the Joker. He's just like, you know, possibly an inspiration. They kind of said I'm pretty sure it was the, in an interview thinking back now. That like this was just like a one of many potential origin stories for the Joker. I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how I feel about all that. Um, have y'all seen Gotham? I haven't. The TV show. I haven't. No. I, I have, and I started to watch it a long time ago, but I just got too many things in the way. That's got the. That's got the. That's got the. The Joker in that is um the kid from uh, Shameless, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and right. His name yeah. is the Jedi, Jerome. The Jedi Fallen Order guy. Jerome. <laughs> yeah, this Jedi Fallen Order. That's right. And um, and his story is very similar to that, as in you don't know if he's the actual Joker or if he's just going to inspire somebody to become the Joker. Well, I think that's important um, to the Joker's character. Right? I, like the right. whole not knowing his actual like that's one of the things I loved about this portrayal back to this film, uh, this portrayal of the Joker is that he keeps telling different origin stories. They're kind of t yes. they're, they're kind of acknowledging yes. The fact that he doesn't have an actual origin in a really clever mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. It's a good call. Yep, very good call. Well, hey, let's jump into our five categories that we use to appraise the film. And Morgan, at any time, Joe and I get on rants here when we get into our category. So at any time, hop in and let us know what you think or if you've got something to add to it. Joe, I'll let you kick us off with our first category, which is narrative. All right. So I'm just going to warn you. I have approximately like 20 to 30 bullet points for each category. So I'm just going to pick and choose a couple here <laughs> and, and then you can fill in the blanks and Morgan can yell at me for skipping things and we'll be all right as rain by the time we finish this, but just don't steal the post-its. <laughs> I won't steal the post-its. That's all. That's all I'll agree to. But so you narrative, you can't talk about the narrative in this without at least initially acknowledging the acting in this. It is top notch. I, like there is a lot of really, I mean, some of the ancillary characters less good, obviously, but and the Batman voice, I could never get on board with the Batman voice. <laughs> I never could do it. But, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Agreed. It's really annoying. Like the first time I heard it, I was able to power through it and just keep going on. But I've seen this film way too many times and now when i hear it it's just funny and i laugh every time yeah and it's not good for evaluation I've, it's not i've come around all the way on it where at first it really bothered me and then i thought it was funny and now i've landed in a spot where i just don't notice it but i don't like it <laughs> right but yeah. yeah Heath ledger obviously gifted just nailed it in this to a a, yeah. a level that is almost hard to watch in multiple spots um and still, you like you watch it now, and you're still fascinated with his performance. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely, Gary Oldman. I love Gary Oldman. He's. I don't think he's ever been bad in anything. Right? He never. Yeah. He's never. I he's agree. very rarely like the star, but he's never been bad in anything. Um, 
across the board. Morgan Freeman's great. You know, I love they take the little like Michael Caine is so. Here's a question for you: Is Michael Caine the best Alfred? Just in general, he's up there. He's yeah, really he's good. I really like him there. as Alfred, and I love the way. One of the things I love about this trilogy is the chemistry between Michael Caine mm-hmm. and Christian Bale. There is a definite like fatherly kind of energy there that yes. really shows. Yeah. It really plays in like a. a I, I just love it. You really feel it. Most of those scenes with Michael Caine and and Christian Bale. Most of them, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority of them are emotional scenes, like sad emotional scenes where he's trying to convince him or he's pouring mm-hmm. emotions out to him. And Michael Caine has water in his eyes every all single time. time. It's and, so and, heartbreaking, and, and his not, scenes. Not just that. So so that, yes, and his acting is amazing. And and he is he is one of those actors that can convey a million emotions just with his face. Without even the tone of his mm-hmm. voice, just with the the articulation of his face, but in this kind of this, I'm gonna tip a tad into the next category for a half a second here. They also play the best music every time Alfred talks. Like every <laughs> time his mouth opens, the music changes and in a really like dramatic, emotional way, which just adds to how amazing all of his scenes are. Um, mm-hmm. So yes, the, I, so the acting, fantastic. Um, the make like the the costumes makeup are really good. Uh, I like the like I said with the Joker, the choice to have the Joker's makeup all messed up and and thrown together and like like wet and melty smeared and smeared and, yeah. dry and, and crusty yeah and, crusty yeah. in spots and like it it's such a good choice and I think that was I mean oh, chef's kiss on the makeup right yeah <laughs> and uh, I like. I have a theory that they made like Heath Ledger make all these like crazy exaggerated facial expressions while they put it on so they could get those creases. Uh, that's like, actually a pretty good point. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, like it wouldn't uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. That that'd be a great way to do it. You know, it's like he just looks like just he looks the way he behaves, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's Way more than you can say about anything that has happened with Bat- with the Batman film since. <laughs> and uh, I like the, the story is good. I, I mean, I'm going to say the, the story, the plot of this for sure is picked and chosen from comic lines and which they do with the MCU stuff, too. Um, I think a little bit some of that felt uh, what's the word I want to use <laughs> like Im- imbalanced. Right. Like they definitely spent a lot more time around going to Hong Kong and chasing Lao down and stuff than I would have liked. And not nearly enough time with Two-Face and to me. And I I think that that felt off. So like I didn't need all of that just to get him back. Like we could have explained away the Lao thing in a much better way without spending 40 minutes of film time on it. Right. Uh (laughs) Mm-hmm. And was it really that much time? I mean, all broken, wow. all broken down. If you take, if you take all the Lao stuff out, it's about, it's probably about thirty-five minutes or so, and it's not all in one straight chunk. But still, they could have trimmed a lot. I mean, the movie's long. They could have trimmed some mm-hmm. of that fat out. I, so I have some complaints, story-wise, pacing-wise, around that, that Lao stuff. But nitpicking, because even that was entertaining to watch. It just wasn't. If I could have chosen, yeah. I would have rather spent that time on Two Face because the Two Face stuff was really intriguing and it seemed like it just happened so fast. Like mm-hmm. there just wasn't enough of it for me. Um, like I said earlier, as I watched this, I just couldn't get over how big of an opportunity they blew with possibly setting up a fantastic DC cinematic universe. And instead, we got whatever we we have now. There were some inconsistencies in a couple of spots, um, uh, like, but nothing, nothing really that bad. Like nothing that I would take huge points away from. I mean, it's a great. This is one of those films that, like, I don't, I don't know for sure. I think I really only have my ranking. I only have one category that's not like in that high upper echelon tier. upper tier, right? Um, yeah. so when we get, we get into that, the things we start picking out are definitely nitpick things, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a, so there's a, a weird spot. I have this in this, in this section for notes, I guess I didn't know where to put it, 
But when, and this is not necessarily, this isn't a plus or a minus, this is just an observation. There was a scene where Batman is standing on a roof, uh, listening in on everybody's phones, trying to find, Mm -hmm. trying to find everybody, right? And there's a voice that says, you'll find Harvey Dent there. And that's when, right? I don't, I don't know who did that voice acting, but man, they sounded so much like Jack Nicholson. I, I was like, man, <laughs> I hope it was. There's no credit for it or anything. I, I hope it was. I have to go back and listen to that. I hope it was. That is cool. I, I really hope it was. I looked for it. I didn't see anything about confirming or denying, whatever, but um, I really hope it was. Uh, and That was something that I really appreciated, though. I'm glad you brought that up, is if you watch the movie back and really pay attention, you notice that they were setting up the whole sonar, you know, Mm -hmm. um, cellular grid throughout the whole movie. And it was just like very little small tidbits leading up to it. And Mm because it was such a big deal for um, Lucius Fox, you know, he was like, I'm resigning after this. I can't, this is wrong. And I, I just thought that was really cool. It was things that I did not notice the first time I watched it. Yeah, they do a great job this whole film in in setups, early setups, late payoffs. They're really it's a really good film for laying groundwork. Yeah. Yeah, it's just well written. This is really well written. It's really well it's written. Put together very yes. nice. And I don't know if it's easier or harder to do that when you're when you're pulling bits from source material and and kind of laying them out. It's probably hard hard to puzzle piece that stuff together, but it it's really great. There's all these little touches, like little decisions I really love. I love the idea of bringing in the copycat Batman stuff. That's, you know, mm. that's always been a, you know, that's showed up in the comics a few times. I, that's like, I always found that entertaining. I love the magic trick there. The, uh, making the pencil, the pencil. disappear. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. That's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a brutal scene. Uh, the Rachel death is absolutely brutal. All that stuff. It's, there's some really aggressive choices in this that I think all paid off. Um, so that that said, narrative, I came in 16 for narrative. Nice. Nice. Okay, so I want to add on a little bit of the Heath Ledger thing because I think it, it's worth mentioning. All those little touches that he does just, just make it just, just, it's just like fine tuning. He's just like tweaking in a perfect character. You know, like the the licking his lips the, with those scars. The way he walks away from the hospital, the 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 you know, like you said, licking the lips, every little thing, the the like the sounds he makes, the little like mm-hmm. like under yes. his breath all the time, like all the little choices he made, just fantastic. He does this thing where I, I wonder if he's trying to insinuate, not split personalities, but different, like just a lot of things going on in his head because he'll talk in a certain cadence. It really stands out in the interview scene where he says, you know, he's talking like this in a certain cadence and he says, they'll cast you out like a leper. And he gets real high pitched, you know, and he does that every once in a while in some of his sentences, which kind of gives you this. There's multiple things going on in his head. He goes the other way, too, when he gets really mad. He gets that real deep growl voice a couple of times. and That is really creepy. You know, when, you know, like there, it shows up when he's uh, that video where he's inter inter interrogating the fake Batman. Yeah, the look at me yeah. when he says look, look at, at me, me and it gets like real. That stuff, like it yeah. just gets like, he he really puts it on in a couple different ways, in a couple different spots with different voices that are just, hmm. yes, he, the, the multiple voices, he probably, I think probably is leaning like on like the multiple personalities thing or, mm-hmm. so, or something. You know, it's hard to say what he was going for, but whatever he was doing, it landed. It for sure landed. It works, yeah. So here's one part that I, I've always thought really shows how much he stands out as an actor. And it's the reaction that he gets from Maggie Gyllenhaal during the party scene. Mm. I have seen Maggie Gyllenhaal say in interviews that it was hard for her to even look at him. And and I, I believe her and her brother and him were all really close. But if you watch her in that scene where the Joker's telling her where the Joker's telling her the story about his wife. She's not acting. She that's like legit fear on her face. You can mm. I mean, you can tell a difference. It, either she's a phenomenal actress, which she's really good, but I, I don't believe that's it. I think she was really scared during that scene with what he was doing. I had even read interviews where, or I had heard reports that Michael Caine actually had more screen time with with 
uh, Heath Ledger in, in the party scene. scene. Yeah. But he was so nervous he couldn't even look at him, and he kept forgetting his lines. And that just puts Heath Ledger on this whole different yeah, plane. It, it shows. Of it shows. So that scene it shows in her face a lot. You're right. But if you look at a lot of scenes, like pr- almost every scene when he gets when he ratchets it, ratchets it up, mm-hmm. you can see it in the other actor. It almost breaks them. Like, yeah. you, like you can you can see the difference, and it's like you said it does put him in like a different tier. Uh, it's it's like it's genuinely scary. Like even as a viewer sitting in front of your TV, his his commitment to that to that persona is genuinely disturbing. Yeah. So I, I originally was at 15, Joe, but I am actually at 16. And he, and here's why, because I kept thinking about two things. I kept thinking about the performance we got from Heath Ledger, which is on a different realm, and the combination of that with the actual story. What's really refreshing about The Dark Knight is that it's like the first superhero film that puts as much emphasis on character development as it does the action scenes. And I'll explain later in the technique section about exactly how Christopher Nolan tries to support the character development with the camera. But this, this, I mean, this story really does equal the action. Uh, Don't get me wrong. Like the action sequences are absolutely amazing. If it's the bank heist or the sky hook or the car chase, it's all really good, but we get, we get legit story arcs from nearly all of these characters and it's not it's not forced it's not out of place and all of these arcs kind of develop separate and then they weave together there towards the end as as you come to a conclusion which usually ends up bad for these characters but that's expected because this is a tragedy i think christopher nolan and his brother jonathan nolan they wrote a, a really good screenplay but we didn't get the depth to this degree in superhero films in other superhero films, we never got to this depth at this point in time. This whole film is constant themes of, of opposites, right? We've got, we've got Harvey's good and Joker's evil. We've got Batman's order and Joker's chaos. The whole thing is set up on this, this idea of opposite, even, even visually, you know, two sides of a coin and opposite sides of the face. I'm just really happy with the theme that they put together and, and how much they focused on character and story in equal parts of action in a film like this. So that that's how I bumped up to 16. I think so. I do think we got the beginning of this in Batman Begins. I think he got more leeway and, and budget for this one, but he was definitely already on this path with like the character developed character centric superhero thing in Batman Begins. Um, but this film brought it to a, a like very escalated level. But if you watch Batman Begins, you can totally see this is the path he wanted to be on. Yeah, I I, I have that in my notes on on uniqueness. Yeah, me too. If Batman <laughs> yeah, Begins too. show Batman Begins started it, but this solidified it as as this is how we're going with with this trilogy and and what it can do for storytelling. All right, so I don't think there's any arguing there, right? We're going sixteen. Yeah, since we both landed it in the same spot, I don't think I have to tell you that you're wrong this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Let's let's talk about music. I I really like the collaboration between Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard. I think you know James Newton Howard. He's a decorated composer, and if you if you really want to see him shine, go watch the film Michael Clayton. I absolutely love that film. And then Hans Zimmer, of course. I mean, this guy's a legend. This is a, this is the dude that gave us the Lion King. You know, so he, this these guys both know what they're doing. Now, technically, we do get that little two-note Batman theme at the very, very end of Batman Begin. At the, we get that theme at the very end of Batman Begins, but it's this film that drives home that theme, and it's just two notes. I think it's amazing that they came up with two simple notes that they can play that really sum up the whole solitude and darkness of Batman. And when you keep things simple like that, and and still be impactful. That gets a lot of respect from me. But there was one thing that I noticed in this film, Joe, it made me think of you. There's this recurring element in the music that's similar to what we got in The Shining. Remember, we'd get that like high screeching, high pitched yeah. sound that yes. happened in The Shining. And you said it really distracted you. I, we have it here as well. I don't think we have it near as much as The Shining or why they used it. it. It's not as shrieky. It, that's that's the, true. It's not it's as like yeah, very high pitched in the, that the, one. The know? Shining, the, the thing about me with the one in The Shining was that it was it genuinely was like shrieky. It wasn't hurt your ears. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. hype. It wasn't just high pitch. It was 
it was shrill and scratchy and and distracting and every 10 minutes right right uh, it was yeah, a very different it was. it was a very different thing in this but i did notice it something that i noticed about the music in this movie is that it was all very subtle like if you mm-hmm. weren't paying close attention, then you wouldn't even notice it was there half the time, except for when it's, you know, much louder. Um, but it seemed almost like there were there was a theme for the different characters. Batman had a very suspenseful, like booming music, especially, you know, when he was Batman and not just Bruce Wayne. And then the Joker had that high pitched screeching frequency not just when he was on camera but when some kind of chaos that he caused was you were waiting to see what happened like with the uh, people on the boat trying to decide if they were going to blow each other up you heard that music yeah Yeah. and um, that's a good call and then you mentioned um, Joe was it you that mentioned Alfred the music playing yeah. when he would talk and Harvey Dent as well. Um, it's like they all had their own tone. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and they weave them together very well. Right. When mm-hmm. the people have, when people have scenes together, the, the balance back and forth in the music shows their different roles. Right. You like Harvey Dent, the, the stuff that plays for Harvey Dent is very like, order and justice and the stuff that plays for, for Batman is also order, but it's definitely, it's less like justice and more intense, right? It's less, Mm -hmm. less like lawyerly and more combatty, right? It's a little more warlike. It's a little more, uh, the word I want to, the word I keep wanting to say is tribal, but that's not exactly the emotion I want to get off. Um, but they do, they do all kind of have their own, like, not just, you know, their characters have their own, not, I don't want to say theme songs, but um, emotional theme through their music that, mm-hmm. that plays, yeah. that connects with the character as the character's development portrays them. You say that much better than I do. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, boss. I think it did a great job. <laughs> well, it also had some, it also had some original music, too. You don't hear it. You don't hear it very much, but and it's not it's not like part of the the weave of the film. But there was some original music playing at like Maroni's nightclub, and you got the bagpipe music, and so we do get a little bit of a mix where it's not just score. There is some some uh, what we would call original music in it. I I wanted to I wanted to give it more and put it in that upper twenty fifth percentile, and I did bump it up over this fifteen thousand mark just slightly, but without having you know, just something memorable or transcending. It was really hard for me to do that. I mean, in some circles you could, you know, walk up to somebody and do the dun dun and they they might know what you're singing, but I don't, that's not universal by any means. So I put it at 16,000. So I'm close. I did not go into that upper third, upper quarter, I should say, not third quarter. I can do math. Uh, I did not go into that upper quarter, (laughs) um, but I'm not far off. And so the reason is like, There just is nothing I would choose to listen to if this film wasn't on. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of this, a lot of the score while very effective. I mean, the score in this does a fantastic job ratcheting up the tension. I mean, even from the first, from the first second of the film, you have that real intense, like stopwatchy kind of beat going going on as they're doing Mm -hmm. that bank robbery and you just feel the tension and it continues to, to ratchet the tension the whole film. It never really gives you a break. And whether it's the tension that's being ratcheted or you get those scenes with Bruce and Alfred where you get this like fatherly emotional rise, it, it always really adds. It's always additive and it ne- it's never noticed in a bad way. But there's not anything super standout. There's not a single super standout. There, are, there is so that two, that like that two note Batman theme that you mentioned, we get a little bit at the end of. Um, Batman Begins. I wonder. So, to in my head, in my ears, that sounds of an awful lot like, and I don't know if this is intentional or if this is just my head making a connection. But if you go back to the Keaton 
Batman films, right? When was the last time you watched one of those, Josh? The Keaton Batman? Well, I watched the surprisingly awful Batman Returns at Christmas time. Yeah, when we did, yeah that, when we did that really show. is surprisingly awful, right? Do you remember the Batman theme from those? That ba 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 uh, it is like the same two notes from the second um, register of that, that, bah, bah, that, that part, mm-hmm. it is those two notes. And it, to me, it always clicks as like, this is a really creative, much better homage to those old, like it, like it sort of to me is like, we're going to ignore like t- in my head, it goes, we're going to ignore all those Schumacher Batman films and go back to the Burton ones and <laughs> yeah. pretend those didn't happen. Right. Wisely. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, those are so side, side jag, my job. Those are really fun to watch, <laughs> but they're not good. Right. Those they're fun. Yeah. yeah right. They're fun, so but fun, good. but they're terrible yeah. films. Uh, they're more fun to watch than Batman, or Batman returns for sure. Uh, but they're I'm so disappointed. They're just with that film. terrible. Yeah. That movie really ru- is rough. It's the pacing. Oof. Oh, yeah. Um, but so back to this film, back on topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> back to music. Back to music. The score does a fantastic job ratcheting the tension up. A little bit, those little nods to like the old school Batman theme from those films, I like a lot. I love the way they, they associate little notes or little, um, man, I'm forgetting the word here, but little like sections, little, little, rhythms to particular characters, little melodies to particular characters and the way the, the emotions of the scenes, it's always additive. Um, there's a couple of moments where the score turns into like a really prolonged steady rumble of one like deep note. And I really like those. There's a couple of spots where like something goes wrong or I'm trying to recall off of my head here. There's a scene, I believe there's a scene when they're in that like very well lit bat cave kind of area. Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> talk, uh, uh, and Alfred is talking. I believe it's when they're talking about the thief that wants to see the world burn. The f- oh, in Burma. Yeah, in Burma the mm-hmm. first time. And the music is just like, it's just like this low, like slowly increasing volume, but like almost one note. Um, and that like is uneasy. The music does a really great job of making you feel uneasy in multiple places. Mm-hmm. And actually, yeah. so preview of next thing. So does the camera does a great job making you feel very uneasy. Um, yeah, but there is nothing that transcended the film to me. And I just couldn't mm-hmm. find anything that really pushed me past that three quarter mark, which is right where I landed at 15. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of in that same area. I I say we call it 15.5 and talk about technique because I I actually, I was surprised with some of the camera work on this one. Oh, there's, so this is the most I've had in technique in a long time. And if that's the case, I think you probably have. (laughs) Well, go, you start and I'll, I will go ahead and check off my list here. (laughs) What you pick up. All right. I'm going to try to blow through what I've got quick because I want to make sure there's enough time for you to to read your book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so first things first, the sound design in this film is spectacular. Every, the, everything, yeah. the sounds of the chase, the way the fighting sounds, we don't get that like stereotypical action movie. It sounds like somebody is slapping a, a side of beef all the time. It's a, kind of sound. It's a thud. Yeah. We, yeah. It, it, everything. The sound design is great. The combat, that truck flip, both, yeah. both the sound Gosh. design and the actual fact that they flipped that truck for real, and there was a dude yeah. driving that thing. That yeah. guy needs an award or something, a lifetime achievement award <laughs> or, some, or something. I, I don't know. Um, Hopefully, he got paid very well. <laughs> really well. Yeah. Um, Hopefully, he's alive. <laughs> the way they muted the sound, or the way the way they muffled the sound, like you were mm-hmm. underwater after Rachel's death, and that that scene, that like that slow that uh, mm. that that like like minute or two after that and the, or the way we get that joker shrill ringing kind of thing that drowns out everything else when dent wakes up in the hospital mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um all that sound design really great the camera it almost never stops moving even in yeah. like the close up 
conversational parts, it's always like slowly zooming in or slowly zooming out or slowly panning up. It's never, it never just rests, which effectively it gives you no, it gives you no rest as a viewer. It also is always telling part of the story. You know, the, the camera is, so there's like a couple of scenes here I, I pulled as specific examples, but it's constant all the way through, right? So the interrogation scene when Batman interrogates Joker, you've got this like, it's it's like really dark behind the Joker, around the Joker. It's just, just Joker's face lit. It's like a Dutch angle. Everything is kind of uneasy. The contrast is really high. It's, it's like this kind of, it's, it's as creepy as the Joker. It's this uneasy mood. Then we get the front facing camera angle on the Joker. The lights turn on Batman standing there. Uh, then you get, which, and Joker's face is like all screwy in that, which, yeah, I, it <laughs> is. Uh, which I love. Um, and then you get like the interrogation goes on, you know, Batman starts beating the crap out of him and the camera angle is looking down at Joker, like from as he's on the ground, which is like mm-hmm. portrays like the lack of power. There's like, although yeah, defeated. Like defeated angle for him. Right. Um, there's like throughout the film in a number of spots, there's a low angle on the camera going up at the Joker and it just feels like uneasy. Like it did this. It just, it just portrays like the chaos and menace of the Joker. Like the scene when Batman is charging him with, the bat cycle thing, which I side note, mm. I hated that eject animation because why would you just spin the tires and burn all the rubber off of them while you're trying to eject? <laughs> like, I don't yeah. understand. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a mechanic. I couldn't help it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when he's charging him and the Joker is walking and he's like doing his crazy walk and he's just shooting at random things and stumbling and doing all that really great physical acting, the camera angle is like, almost on the ground pointed up at him Mm. and it's just like he just looks it's just a great menacing do it I want you to do it like that whole thing it's just that that camera tells a story the whole time there and it's I mean even little things like every time there's a really important piece of dialogue to the story the camera pulls in really tight on the on the actor it Mm -hmm. I like that you said that I'm gonna expand on that but I'm glad you you picked up on that. Yes. I'm, I'm glad I picked up on it too. Cause I thought <laughs> that tells me you might've judged me if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also just a few really gorgeous shots. Um, you know, or I shouldn't say gorgeous, but really iconic shots. Like obviously it's really well known. It was like the poster and everything, but the shot of the Joker in the jail cell as it slowly pans back and he's sitting there. Mm-hmm. That's a great shot. There are so many really great shots but they really put they really put their money where their mouth was with the camera work on this telling the story with subtle camera movements like i said it never it just never rests it's always the, there are films we've watched where i feel like they set the camera up and they filmed a conversation or they filmed a scene and the camera was placed somewhere that just made sure everything was on camera mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this every scene feels like the camera is intentionally placed and in, moved in a specific way to support what's happening on screen. I thought it was really yep. well done. Uh, I landed at 16,000 on technique. Okay. We're really, really close. Um, I'll, I'll tell you now I'm at 16, five. That's really close when we're, well, I'm right. And you're wrong, Josh. Like <laughs> <laughs> so here's how we're, this is why we're going to split it. All right. Practical effects you mentioned, I think, have to be have to be talked about and focused on. And we don't typically we don't typically give a whole lot with that. But in a film like this, you just have to recognize it. It it just adds to all that realism. And I and I think it's important for us to to notice the practical effects more and more now because they're, we're getting farther and farther away from ever using mm-hmm. them. And I personally, I think like, so that, that tractor trailer scene is a hundred times better because it really happened and it looks Mm -hmm. like it really happened and it feels like it really happened. They could have CGI'd that, but there would, 
there would be that like CGI sheen on it and it would just not be as good. And yeah, I, I, I feel like the practical effects are, are definitely worthy of rewarding here. It, if it would have been a special effect, we would not have got the reaction in the cinema that I got when I saw it the first time. And the whole crowd in unison went, whoa, because you could tell that was something real that happened. It was amazing that they did that to get to see something like that happen, just to get it on film. It's incredible. So, yeah, I, I, I did. I did give a little bit more this time in technique than I had in the in the past and, and even special effects, the ones that they did use, like Harvey's face and the those digital scans of Gotham that Batman uses, the sonar stuff, that was all really well done, too. There's, there was nothing wrong that stood out on that. There was on that, one but, spot where Harvey's face looked wrong. but Yeah, I, I know. I, I, I did catch a couple, but yeah, they didn't overdo right. it. Like, they didn't make it move very much at all. You know, they just kept it just static most of the time, which, which was good. Was really good. The, the one spot that really stood out to me for his face was when it was shortly after he first rolled over to show it when he was mm-hmm. talking when he was in the hospital still and there was one spot and I don't remember if he was talking to Gordon or the Joker at this point but he was still in the hospital bed where the lighting on like the bone and teeth in his mouth didn't match the scene quite right and it, mm-hmm. it you could you could see it right like the the the, the, like, the easiest way to pick out bad CGI is when the lighting doesn't line up right mm-hmm. you like if the like it's just the, the highlighted area, right? And there was one spot where I was yeah. like, ooh, his teeth are way too bright right now. <laughs> like through through yeah. the hole in his face. <laughs> they shouldn't be that bright. There's no light there. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, though, it really, especially considering, you know, we're approaching 20 years, uh, the, it was really good. It was It still holds up really well. Yeah. As far as the camera is concerned... I think you're right, Joe. I think it's real smart. I think it's evident of a really smart and competent director. He does two things. He uses some basic camera work through a lot of it, and then he sneaks in some really smart ones. I'll talk first about some of the basic camera work, and you already picked up on it. Just like on Batman Begins and just like in The Dark Knight Rises, there are a lot of the same types of shots. It's medium close-ups, which are usually around the shoulder and chest to the top of the head, and then medium shots, which is about the same, but you get a little bit of, of the more of the body so that you can see some body language. What both of these shots do and what they're intended to do is highlight the acting. And with a cast like this, that's really important. You want to highlight those actors that you got, because when you highlight the acting, you're focusing on, on character. And you know that he was doing this in these shots when you go back and look at them, Because Christopher Nolan uses a longer lens, which creates a really shallow depth of field. In other words, the background's out of focus, which takes your eyes straight towards those characters. And remember what I mentioned earlier about the Dark Knight narrative focusing on characters. He does all that. So all that merges really well together with what he's trying to do. But it's not just those standard shots, though. He does do a few standout ones. The opening shot, I already mentioned, it's a great establishing shot. I think it's a great way to open an action film. But my favorite, my absolute favorite use of the camera in this film is, is so smart and it's so overlooked. You you'll you never even pick up on it. When they're at the restaurant with Bruce and N- Natasha, Natasha uh, and Rachel and Harvey. So we get the camera circling around the table, mm-hmm. but it circles in completely different directions depending on who's talking. So opposite mm-hmm. directions for opposite opinions. And we talked about the theme earlier with opposites. And then just as Harvey says that we're the ones that appointed the Batman when we let Scum take over the city, the spinning completely stops and you get a slow zoom in on Bruce and then you get a slow zoom in on Harvey showing you that these characters are now aligned and anytime a zoom occurs when a character's talking pay attention because you're probably going to get the theme and that's when we do you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain i yeah. love that whole scene uh, that whole thing i just think that that is what we talk about when we talk about when you use the camera to tell the story that's exactly what they're doing i think it was genius genius scene and then you, you get some of those other ones you were talking about, Joe, those ones that are just classic shots, like the Joker with his head out the car window. Um, that's already been paid homage to in Todd Phillips' Joker. But going back to a little bit of that opposite theme, we also have another one towards the end where we have the shot of Joker after Batman saves him, and the camera does a complete 180-degree turn from upside down to right side up. Mm. So 
I, I think it's all intentional. I think exactly what you said, Joe, everything's very intentional. So with all that kind of being said and, and taking into account some of the practical effects, that, that's how I got to 16.5. So man, being that close, let's call it 16.250 and see what you think about longevity. Morgan, unless you have anything else to add on technique. Um, well, I think, uh, I think that's okay. I think it does deserve a little more than that. But, um, like I was really impressed with a lot of, obviously Batman is going to have a bunch of cool gadgets that seem too over the top, like too unrealistic, but I felt like they did a really good job with, um, him like, uh, you know, flying from building to building and it not looking overly complicated, but also not looking completely unrealistic. Um, Mm -hmm. as well as like his escape from, uh, Lau's office building, the, I forget what they called it. The hook, some kind of sky hook. Yeah. The sky hook. The the CIA had a thing called the sky hook for extracting (laughs) people in hostile situations. Like that was an actual thing. I didn't, I didn't know that. I don't know if that actually existed, but, but, but I mean, that looked, um, it was kind of like, you know, can that actually work? But, but it looked really good despite Mm -hmm. that. And then also like the magic trick with the pencil, that was, (laughs) yeah, I love that. That was not CGI. That was, uh, the pencil was actually there and they filmed it without the pencil as well. And then they spliced them together. And then if you slow it down, you can see where Heath Ledger has his hand on the guy's forehead um, and throws him backwards. So it looks <laughs> like he bounced really hard off of the table. It it's, was just such a well-designed scene, including with the camera work. And, and a good payoff with, ta-da! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just really funny. Uh, that's pretty much all I had to say about technique. All right, maybe we maybe we chalk up a few bucks in the in the special category, Joe, so we don't um, you know, so we have a have a job tomorrow. I, I would <laughs> I would be willing while we're while we're here. I think I would be willing to just come up to you on this one if you want. Okay, sixteen five hundred. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, think it, I think it is. I can live with all that. Right. Sixteen five hundred. It is for technique. Last couple of categories that we have: longevity and uniqueness. Spoiler, one of those is real low for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of those are pretty low for me. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, uniqueness is a little low for me. Longevity for me, well, I'm still up there where I have been. I'm at 15.5 for longevity. We get so many quotes out of this thing. That I'm not even going to start with naming all the quotes, but we have so many. I've already mentioned a couple. I think, I think we've mentioned all of them so far, except for the hero we deserve, but not the hero we deserve, but the hero we needed. So all really solid quotes. They're not up there with like the quotes of all time. Like there's no place like home. You know, it's not going to last like that, but it's still really high up there. You know, I I might argue with that slightly. Uh, I think in regular conversation, I've heard why so serious more than no place like home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can't walk up to anybody in this world and say, why so serious? I it, don't or I walk up to them and say, what movie did there's no place like home come from? And they're going to look at you and be like, you serious? Why so serious? I, and then walk I off. Think, <laughs> I think, I think if you ask anybody, it might be a slightly smaller pool, maybe, but I'm pretty sure if you ask anybody where why so serious came from, they might not be able to say which Batman film, but they're going to say it's Heath Ledger's Joker. I think they're, mm-hmm. I think everybody's going to know that. I, I don't think I don't think if you use the the general population you will. I bet you if you uh, the seeing, the people our age and this in our circle one hundred percent every single one of them will get it. I'm going to I'm so this will be a w- what about your mom? Go- Would your mom say, know which one it is? I was going to say it. Is. I was just going to say uh, I'm going to I bet you my mother does know and we will return. I will ask her. <laughs> so <laughs> Sunday nights we have family dinner. Uh, I'm going to ask her, and on the next episode, we'll get resolution, but I'll bet you she knows this answer. <laughs> oh, that's it's probably great. the only, it I'm going to say good. this is probably the only quote from this film that hits that level. I think there's a bunch of really quotable moments, but I think this is that's probably the only one that gets all the way up there. Because remember, that was like almost forced. When the marketing for this film came out, it was everywhere. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. it was on mm-hmm. posters, it was on commercials, it was, it was everywhere. 
Now, if it was a crappy film, that would be really, we would look back at that as like annoying, but because the film was fantastic and that scene was fantastic and Heath Ledger was amazing, it ends up being a, a different conversation, right? It, we don't mm-hmm. necessarily criticize the film for how hard it pushed that line, but I do think that line definitely became a like really big touchstone. So I, I, I think it's fair to say, it, uh, so it's the Karen litmus test here, right? We say, Mom, what film did Why So Serious come from, and what film did There's No Place Like Home come from? Oh, she she for sure knows the first. She for sure knows No Place exactly. Like Home. I'm, but I'm, exactly. I'm confident. And do, you, and do you know it? Do you know it? Uh, you know where that came from, too. Uh, um, help me? Oh, don't even lie here. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'm not buying it. <laughs> Not buying it. Fifteen five hundred for me from longevity. That, that's kind of worth. I bet you're really close to that too. I bet you're really close. Joe, to that. you ask your mom, and I'll ask the two eighteen year olds that work at our shop tonight. Whenever I go to work. Now that's interesting. You <laughs> ask some people younger; they may look at you like, "Who's Heath Ledger?" Yeah. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I, they might. I, I think. But I, don't I don't think so. I don't know. I think so. Like for for one, that whole like this is a weird thing for me. But uh, having some uh, family friends who are in that like younger age group, there's like a weird thing with like late '90s or early 2000s pop culture becoming really popular again right now. Mm-hmm. In a way that yeah. I don't I don't understand. Like, uh, I, <laughs> yeah. Because like, when I watch the, if I go back to those like that generation films like the pop films like can't hardly wait and 10 things ahead about you like i can't sit through them like there's something that yeah. i just find like really <laughs> off-putting about that whole era gilmore girls All that stuff, it's just all that all that stuff though not it's there was like a weird like there was a weird tone to that era that i don't find very appealing but for some reason it's all coming back and i and i think Heath Ledger probably doing pretty well considering the films, um, the films that he was in in that era. Um, mm-hmm. I, I feel like he's probably doing pretty well with younger groups right now. Yeah. Where I, do you stand with longevity, okay, Joe? Go ahead. Um, no, no, go, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, Morgan. I was just gonna say, I, you know, I was a young girl when Ten Things I Hate About You came out, so I like that movie. And then A Knight's Tale is a a great movie. I, I um, love A Night's Tale, by the way. I'm going to make Josh mm-hmm. watch that for a staff selection. It's on, it's on our listener list. It's on our Is listener it? list. So we should be doing that. Why haven't mm-hmm. we done that yet? It's a fantastic film. It's so silly. Because I control the program. Yeah, because you don't want to do it. <laughs> so if you don't do it off the listener list, if you don't if you don't honor one of our listeners, staff I will. Staff selection's coming, yeah. <laughs> um, longevity for me. So all the mainstays are here, right? The effects hold up. The story and characters are... Well, they're let me say they're timeless. They're the DC DC story, DC heroes, DC villains. You know, they're gonna be around. They have been and are going to be around for a long time. The Joker is probably the most in this film is probably the most iconic live action Joker we've seen, right? I think he's the one that people go back to all the time when you ask him who their favorite is, as mm-hmm. we discussed already, right? All those things, right? It's quotable, it's got all this stuff. I agree with and just entertaining. Right? It was just totally entertaining. Still, I can't help and and so this is the one category. Well, I shouldn't say that because uniqueness. There is some outside influence from what came before, but longevity is the one category that I think what happens after a film comes out sort of plays a little bit. And I can't help but think this film's longevity is currently lightly affected by what DC and Marvel have done in its wake. While The Dark Knight Rises was good, it wasn't as good, and it's been a real steep drop-off since. It's been basically, DC Mm -hmm. stuff's been garbage since. And MCU has really just taken off running. And I don't hear the same excitement for DC and DC characters in general anymore. Not just on film, but in print everything. Like Even when you look at like the sales number of comics, DC is getting hammered by Marvel now. Like, just Mm -hmm. the overall, like, the overall opinion on going back to DC stuff is at a pretty all time low right now. Uh, and that's largely because of what, you know, the BVS and justice league stuff. It's just been really bad. And in an unfortunate twist of fate, the style and tone of this film did not have a lasting impact 
on the genre, especially on DC side. And while I wouldn't hammer, I wouldn't hammer this film for what's came after it. It does affect, you know, like talk about longevity. We're talking about people wanting to go back to watch it, right? Do people still want to watch this film? And when you look at what DC has done to their properties, to the na- to the the popularity of their properties since this, they have definitely driven it down, right? It's, it's inarguable. People, the the box office numbers have been slowly dropping, although you know they're getting great return on investment because you're not spending any money on the movies compared to Marvel anymore either. They're just pumping out mm. trash to, to make easy money, um, <laughs> mm. but. With the exception of Joker, which made a ton of money on a small profit or on a small budget. Um, So there's hope in the future. So I was kind of in the same place as you for for most of those things. I came in a little bit lower looking at just where this property stands and how it holds up. There's also, you know, a couple little things in the film where the word I want to use here, like little bits and pieces that stand out. Like we talked about the cell phone problem in the memento episode, right now, luckily this is post cell phone. So we don't quite have that, but it is kind of in that, like smartphones aren't a huge thing era, but it's not the phones that really stood out to me. It was like, it was little bits and pieces where like some of his like future tech didn't seem quite as future as it did when the movie came out. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it felt a little more like, Oh, I could see that being in Radio Shack <laughs> or, yeah. or something, right? <laughs> like it's just like some of the some of the future. Maybe that's why I felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of the future tech that felt really crazy in, when this film came out felt a little more achievable now. Uh, and I think yeah. that, you know, as we continue down that path pretty soon, it's going to be like, well, Batman has a chump, <laughs> right? What is this? This is in future. Um, so mm-hmm. I think some of that stuff played negatively for it. But all that said, like. I'm nitpicking. I still came in at 15. Yeah. Still, still really close. I, I like where we're headed. Cause we're right on, right on target. 15, 500 from me, 15 from you. I, I'll, I got to make a confession here. I did look to see where my valuation on this category landed compared to others on the definitive list. And it was higher than some pretty, some, some really classic films, but this value, this valuation for me is a, it's like a snapshot of where we're at exactly right now. Meaning like, I, I think this category probably has a few years on it to make this maybe slightly higher, but I, I'm just wondering that after a few more years have passed in this category, will this film peak really soon and then start decreasing compared to those classics, which it gets near on the list. I, I don't know. We'll see. I just thought it was really interesting where my evaluation of it and where it landed but if we if we stick with what we're doing here, fifteen two fifty, that's that's not bad. That's really close. Yeah, we're right in the same ballpark. All right, man. Uniqueness. It's all you. All right, I'm gonna blow through this. I don't have a lot of notes because this is a pretty middle of the road category for me. It's based on storylines from the comics. I mean, even admittedly, he took a lot of this from like the Killing Joke and another another storyline or two. Uh, the characters mm-hmm. are from the comics. It's certainly a much darker take and a much more character driven take on superhero films than we were typically used to seeing at the time, but it is, and it also, like I should say, also the execution considerably better than we were used to seeing out of superhero films. But Batman began started us down that path for sure. This is very in line with where he was heading with that film. I feel like that film, he had a little more restraint on him. This film, he had a, the, the leash was off a little more, right? Um, just like the Joker, mm-hmm. took the dog off the leash. Um, and, uh, but it is still very in line with the superhero formula, which is the problem DC still has is that they have not found a way to get outside of the superhero formula for films. Like the Marvel stuff, they tend to to lean into like, well, this is just a, this is just a spy movie and we're just going to plug two superheroes in, or this is a comedy. We're going to plug two superheroes in, or this, you know, whatever they, they're still, DC is still ha- was then and still is just doing superhero movies with the caveat that this is definitely way more about the characters and their motivations than it is about the overarching storyline, right? It is very character driven. Um, but it does, it is, it is very much so like in line with the Batman stuff that came before it. 
Um, especially, and I shouldn't say just stuff. I should specify like the comics and stuff were definitely leaning in this direction a decade before this film came out. Um, and so the inspirations were taken, right? We talk about, so I know the screenplay was not like, it was not directly pulled from a book or from a comic, from a comic, but it for sure was, you know, it's not quote unquote adapted, but it for sure a lot of these story beats were pulled from a couple of comics and, and combined. Um, and I think that's important to note here because it's not really straight up all original, right? It's not when we talk about an original screenplay, when we're evaluating this versus an adapted screenplay, this lands closer to adapted to me. I don't know if you want to argue that or not, but it sure does for me in my mind land closer on the adapted side. And then at the end of the day, the the character driven nature of this film is really the only thing that's not well and execution. Cause it's certainly better than the, the Batman movies that came before it. But, um, <laughs> It's the only thing that's really stepped outside of that that path for me. Um, so I, I came in at 11, which I gave it some points for what it had done. I think I would probably be at 12 or 13, probably no higher than that if this was Batman Begins. But we saw a lot of this stuff trending already in the film before it. And like we talked mm-hmm. about with who were we talking about when we talked about this? Um, I don't remember which episode that was now. <laughs> mm. Oh, it was the Reservoir Dogs episode. Uh, yeah. Tarantino films. Yeah, there you go. Way more points yeah. for his style early, way less points for his style late, right? And to me, this is not the first of this style. It's just the best of the style. And we're talking uniqueness. We're looking at origins more than execution a little bit to me. So 11 is where I landed. Morgan, what do you think? You think 11's fair? You think higher? Um, I think, uh, I think maybe a little higher. I don't know. I, something that I thought was really unique about the Dark Knight was, um, the Two-Face origin story. Even though mm-hmm. it was pretty quick, um, to me, it was like an unexpected, um, storyline that got, you know, brought about, um, towards the decline of the film and it kept it exciting. Like it was, um, I don't know. I just felt like it was a unique, uh, plot to introduce something that you just don't typically see, like just a random, uh, story out of nowhere and the kind of, um, the relationship between the Joker and Harvey Dent um, and the progression of that. I don't know. I just felt like uh, the story was a little more uniquely crafted than Joe assumes. <laughs> I I think I fell in the same camp as, as both of you guys where, except I, I, I probably started off around 10. Uh, well, maybe I was started off around level. I was some 11. I was somewhere around that area. I took it to 13 and the reason that I am at 13 is that we got a a lot, a lot like what you're saying, Morgan, we did get a story unlike anything that we had seen so far on film for Batman. And it's a really good story, but we finally got recognition for actors contributions in a superhero film. If y'all remember in 2008, the Oscars snubbed this film across the board. Like they snubbed them for, they didn't even let them compete for best score. Cause they said there was too many composers, whatever. And then they snubbed it for best picture. And this is the first time when everybody was like, no, this should be in the category for even, even the artists were saying, Hey, why is not, why is this not in the category?" And so I think what this did was this was the first big step in the direction, you know, Marvel took it to a whole different level but this is the first time we finally got recognition for serious storytelling for actors recognition and it solidified that you know the public can handle and want stories like this of a serious nature right 13 might be a little high joe what, what do you think 12 is okay would you you'd be cool with 12 <sighs> I, uh, <laughs> you're fine yeah, you go to 12 yeah. although <laughs> yeah yes. i don't want to but i will <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's good all right, 
let's total it up. That brings us to seventy five thousand two fifty. That mm. is a that's a pretty good score. I I honestly in my head thought this would end up around the seventy eight seventy nine, but uh, this is the system we have, and and I, I I'm I agree with the system. So it falls where it falls, seventy five thousand two fifty. Joe, it, in comparison to the guest list, what does that put us? That puts. I mean, actually, it's a pretty good spot. That puts us. Oh man, we really fall in a in a spot here. Uh, it puts us. We in, have. Yeah, there's a sweet spot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, we are. That puts us at number nine on the guest list. One below. Oh, wow. One below Mem- Memento and one above The Matrix, which. All good movies, man. Yeah, All I have complicated movies. feelings about it being above the Matrix, because uh, the Matrix <laughs> really did change things going forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so when we, yeah, when when I saw where this was headed, like in this in the seventies range, it, I thought I thought the same thing. I'm like, man, what what happened with the Matrix? Why is it at seventy five? But then I remembered the Matrix. The Ma- I'm going to use your term here. It aped so much stuff off of the Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, I did. That it just got beat up on uniqueness. It got beat up hard. Yeah, but this one also. I can't believe I broke the top ten. This one also not super unique, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know, looking at this, like looking at them side by side, I think maybe we landed a little hard on longevity for the Matrix. I think if we went back and talked about the Matrix longevity wise, we we might be able to come up there because I think that's the category. Looking at where it landed, I think that's the category. If I had to second guess myself where I would be second guessing. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I can see it coming up on, on longevity a bit. Well, as far as the definitive list, all right, the definitive list is our top 25 films. We started with a a random group of films from AFI and then as guests and listeners and staff did their films, we populated it. And so right now the dark Knight comes in on the definitive list Number 23, it broke into the top 25 at 75,250. It is in the company of Memento, Toy Story, then The Dark Knight, then The Matrix, then The Princess Bride. Man, I gotta watch all of these films. All really good. But it broke into the top 25. That's, that's, that's respectable. That's really respectable. I'm happy with that. Well, Joe, let's do this. We've got a, we've got an interesting film that's coming up on the next show, not our typical selection for films, but it's one of our film appraiser elite selections. So if you are a member of our, our Patreon subscription, which by the way, I had to go back while we were talking and look to see who recommended a night's tale. And it was cab, another Patreon. So I lied. I love the night's tale. I think that that's the best film ever. So, so thank you cab for bringing us that and for giving us some money. And we're going to be doing that. We'll be but, doing it shortly. <laughs> I will make sure of and it. that will be on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the next episode, we're going to have one of our patrons selected a film. It is from 1962, and we'll give you this soundbite to help tease it. Joe, take it away. Oh, let me browse. I'm going to have to go a ways back to find the soundbite right on this one. It is not yeah. anywhere. going to have to go use I'm the, have to get the, the analog the knobs Rolex, to the find Rolex this one. out to find where I, where I, the card catalog to find where I left this one. <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh, there it is. Let's go. So dusty. <laughs> Very dusty. Maybe a little bit of mildew, in fact. The speech is short, but it's the most rousing speech I've ever read. It's been worked on here and in Russia on and off for over eight years. I shall force someone to take the body away from him. Then Johnny will release those microphones and those cameras with blood all over him, fighting off anyone who tries to help him, defending America even if it means his own death rallying a nation of television viewers into hysteria to sweep us up into the White House with powers that will make martial law seem like anarchy. All right, so I, I don't think many people are going to recognize that one. I, I really don't. I, I, I will say, though, that I have seen this before. It has been a long time. It hasn't been as long as since the film's been around, but there are some very cool um, camera techniques that they use in this film. I will say that. And at the very beginning, it's really interesting. And the story is very unique, especially for the year that it came out. So I I don't know. Maybe we'll be surprised. I haven't ever actually watched this one. Um, I've seen remake and follow-ups. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 
I'm genu- generally aware of the concept and idea of this film, but uh, I don't... I, there are very few films I head all the way back to, oh, 25 years before my existence for. So... <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it. We're gonna dig into this one. I'm sure it'll be great. I can't wait. We'll we'll dig into it. Hey, last night was another Barrel House Live. How'd that go? Oh, it was good. So yesterday, as we recorded this, last night's Barrel House Live was on World Whiskey Day. So sweet. Um, the last episode of the Barrel House that I released on the main feed there was for Michter's Barrel Strength Rye, which is a once every two or three year at best release. And I just happened to stumble upon it at a liquor store locally, and so I immediately bought it. Nice. And so I did that episode, and while I'm not usually a rye whiskey guy, um, it's usually a little uh, not my favorite direction for whiskey. I really liked that Michter's, and I started. I was I mentioned on the episode that I was like, kind of, I was like, uh, like wondering, like thinking aloud if I'd had a better rye ever or bang for your dollar, because that Michter's Barrel Strength Rye, not inexpensive. As you can imagine, as it being a once every couple of year release at best, not cheap. So I was thinking about like bang for your buck. So last night on the live stream, I busted out all of the like ryes I know I really like and did a little rye face off to see which one landed as best bang for a dollar, which one I liked the most. And then afterwards had a sampling of every whiskey I have from a different country made sure to represent every country for world whiskey day. Uh, and then cool. cleaned up like 47 glasses this morning. So that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And you can find that at barrel house podcast.com that will have links to every single thing that you could possibly want from me. Uh, that's a lot easier than reading all the things, which is fantastic. And what we won't do. So just go to film If you want the things. Yeah. Filmpages.com, and we find can just the things. And when you're that. doing com, you can also go to iTunes and rate and review the show, which is hugely important and especially helpful for us. Also, tell all your friends, like just tell everybody you know, yeah. or maybe like take their phone out of their hand it. by force yep. and subscribe to the show and then tell them. And then throw their throw their phone in the yeah, river. Yeah, well, tell them if they, so they, can't tell them if they unsubscribe that they're going to pay for it. <laughs> They'll regret the day they unsubscribe <laughs> from this show. <laughs> rue the day. You'll rue the day. <laughs> Well, hey, Morgan, thanks for coming on. It is it is always a blast to have you on, and you always pick really good films. So yeah, thanks for spending time with us, and, and hope that you can hang out for a bit and join us over in the after show for a few minutes. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I think I got a few extra minutes for you. All right. Then we can really, really start ragging on Joe. I can't oh, wait. Yeah. I can't wait. I, <laughs> I love being the butt of everybody's jokes. It's how I exist. <laughs> All right, everyone. If you're a patron... Please stick around and join us in the after show. For everybody else, thank you all for listening and goodbye. The Film Appraisers was created by Josh McRae, produced by Joe Kane and Josh McRae, graphics by Albert Padilla, and voiceover by Morgan Marshall. The thoughts, expressions, views, opinions, and the like are those of the guests and the host of the film appraisers and do not represent the opinions of any entity associated with the creation or distribution of the films discussed herein.